Uh, hi there, uh, John Wood. Welcome to the Glenn Show. Glad to be back. Thank you so much, Glenn. Yes, indeed. This is Glenn Lowry, Glenn Show, bloggingheads.tv. I am uh, speaking from my office in the Department of Economics at Brown University. Uh, and I have to say that I'm grateful to the Watson Institute for Public and International Affairs at Brown for sponsoring the Glenn Show. I'm also a professor of international public affairs here. So, uh, John, welcome back. John Wood is the uh, Director of Media Development for an organization called Better Angels. And John and I had had a previous conversation at the Glenn Show that I thought was very enlightening on the work of his organization. And I wanted to have you back uh, to talk more about that. Uh, why don't we begin by you uh, explaining to people, that is the few people out there who don't already know, uh, <laughs> what Better Angels uh, aims to do and, and, and how you all are going about trying to do it. Mm, yeah, indeed. Yeah, well, for folks who missed uh, our previous uh, conversation, uh, yeah, Better Angels is a national uh, bipartisan organization, uh, a grassroots organization that is dedicated to the project of depolarizing American politics, and you might say rebuilding civil society and strengthening the social fabric. Uh, and so we're a membership organization that has been covered uh, pretty extensively in national media, uh, mostly for a program that we have for a workshop activity that we have. Uh, it's called a Red and Blue Workshop. The way that works is we go into local communities across the country and we bring together small groups of folks from the left and the right, or blues and reds, as we say in-house, uh, to give them the opportunity not so much to debate or argue politics, but to speak from the vantage point of their own personal experience in terms of why it is they see politics the way that they do. And we put folks through a, through a series of guided exercises, uh, moderated exercises, that allow them to get a sense as to what the internal dialogue on the other side of the aisle actually sounds like. So we can begin to see each other past the political uh, stereotypes uh, with an eye for understanding just what our genuine human motivations are. And so this does a few things. Uh, one, it strengthens relationships between people of different political points of view who may not have otherwise had an empathetic sense of who the other one was before. It sets the groundwork for further uh, coordination and collaboration potentially on local issues. And as this culture of uh, more sort of elevated civic engagement develops, uh, we believe that this sort of change in the nature of our politics would allow us to stabilize the workings of our institutions on a broader scale by restoring a personal sense of trust between people on both sides of the aisle, uh, tampening the uh, tamping down the toxicity of our partisan relationships. Okay, so, so me, it's important. Oh yeah, sorry. To Go yeah. ahead. I, I didn't mean to interrupt. Please finish. Yeah, indeed. So that's what we've been known for uh, in, in terms of media coverage or these workshop exercises. But Better Angels is a much more dynamic organization than simply that. Uh, we have debate programs that we're beginning to pilot and launch on college campuses uh, that invite people to compare and contrast differing points of views in a way that highlights uh, intellectual humility as opposed to simply seeking to uh, defeat your opponent in a political, uh, political exercise. We have a digital media network, which I oversee. Uh, on the conversation page on our website, we have the Better Angels podcast, a host of blogs, and so on and so forth. We've got a national convention coming up, our second national convention uh, in St. Louis. And for folks who are interested in that, maybe we can uh, include a link, but that, uh, that information is on our website. Last year, we had 150 uh, uh, delegates come out from across the country. We'll have twice that many this time around, including media and so on and so forth. What we're seeking to do is to create an infrastructure for a new way of engaging politics across the party divide, something that's, again, focused on reasserting the health of our social fabric as opposed to just being a vehicle for partisan combat, if you will. So, you know, Glenn, I think it's sort of a socially revolutionary type thing in a, in a positive and rehabilitating uh, direction. And, uh, you know, most of the folks, uh, many folks listening to us here have already heard me give some of the details, so I'll probably leave it at that. But I definitely encourage people to check it out, to get involved, and to become a member if anybody is so inclined. 
clearly you could go on talking about this for a very long time. Uh, I can see your the, the energy and enthusiasm you bring to the task, but let me just ask you straight up. So 2016 happened that Donald Trump got elected president to many people's surprise. Uh, and in the aftermath of that, uh, bitterly fought campaign, lock her up, lock her up, uh, et cetera, uh, grab her by the pussy on the other side, kind of thing like that. Uh, uh, bitterly fought campaign, uh, very divisive uh, rhetoric, uh, the press are the enemy of the people and so on. Uh, Trump is a traitor in league with the Russians and so on. Uh, I'm guessing that that specific set of political events had a lot to do with a motivation for trying to get people around a table and get them to look past what might be their superficial political differences to see that we're all in this together and so on. Is, is that is that right? I mean, and if so, mm-hmm. uh, then how do you uh, situate yourselves in this far-flung enterprise that you're building now with David Blankenhorn and other colleagues? How do you mm-hmm. situa- situate yourselves within the context of the very real conflict uh, mm-hmm. you know, that's going to come. People are, in fact, being appointed to the Supreme Court, you know, mm-hmm. even as we speak. Uh, major initiatives have been undertaken with respect to uh, how it is that we deal with the issue of immigration in the country. Mm-hmm. Uh, the uh, uh, architecture of U.S. trade relations with countries around the world is being reconfigured. The involvement of the United States in the North Atlantic Treaty Organization is being reconceived. These things are actually happening. Mm-hmm. So is that all above your radar that you don't, you don't sully yourselves with having to actually take positions mm-hmm. uh, about these things? Should Trump be impeached, for example, et cetera? Do you avoid, would it just be a little bit too disruptive to talk about the actual things that are happening in the country mm-hmm. uh, around these kitchen tables where you're getting the reds and the blues uh, to recognize each other's humanity? Oh, we talk about you see what though. I'm asking you? I mean, are you no, opting out of the actual debate in the interest of trying to smooth over <laughs> and to ruffle feathers and so on? Right. No, no. You're asking, you're asking the question, can better angels really operate effectively or in a meaningful way without taking a hard and fast position on things that are happening in, in our political situation right now that have immediate relevance to people's actual lives and that impact their attitudes towards one another in the political context? Can we be effective without addressing the elephants in the room? So exactly. Speak? That's exactly what I'm asking. Very well said. Indeed. But we do address the elephants in the room, but we do it in a particular way, and we don't do it in a way that necessarily ties the organization as a whole to one position or the other, because the organization is dedicated to fostering relationships across the divide. So what we do is, there's a culture of conversation in Middle Angels. Um, well, let me, let, me, let me explain it this way. First of all, you asked what was, was the 2016 election, sort of what brought about the existence of Better Angels. Okay. And yeah, it was the catalyzing event. I, I didn't come on board with Better Angels uh, until I guess it was fall of 2017 or so. But after sort of seeing the historic kind of breakdown and, you know, social trust in the 2016 election, David Blankenhorn, uh, who you know well, as well as Professor uh, Bill Doherty of the University of Minnesota, uh, and my colleague David Lapp from Ohio, they got together a group of Trump voters and Clinton voters in South Lebanon, Ohio, for the very first Better Angels workshop, which was a three-day affair, wound up being very successful and wound up being the seed for everything that has sort of happened uh, happened since. It was very successful in the sense of providing understanding and uh, a, new, a new sort of rapport between these people who had voted differently in the most contentious election in our lifetime. Now, Better Angels, just so you know, we do have something called alliances. And these are, in effect, in effect, local Better Angels chapters. And our Better Angels alliances, although they are still developing, they, um, the processes for them are still developing, they have the autonomy to actually render, uh, to, to endorse or organize around policy issues in their own local communities. So on a community, on a municipal or statewide level, Better Angels members, so long as there is a threshold of bipartisan agreement within the Better Angels Alliance, uh, can organize around a particular policy issue on that basis. And so in a, in a, um, in a compartmentalized sense, Better Angels chapters, Better Angels alliances can take positions. Better Angels nationally does not take a position. 
in our podcast, I will take a position on an issue. My colleague, uh, my co-host, Kieran O'Connor, on the Better Angels podcast, uh, he'll take an ish- a position on an issue. We have people who write articles who take positions on issues. Better Angels members and leaders take positions on issues all the time as individuals. The thing that the theme, however, of our position taking, taking, whether as individual Better Angels chapters in different parts of the country or as individual members or leaders within the organization, is that in articulating our position of support for one policy or one candidate for another, we do so in a way that strives to steel man the position of the, of the folks on the other side, that seeks to understand the genuine motivation for disagreement that comes from the other side, as opposed to sort of ascribing demonized or dem- demagogic sorts of motivations to people that we, that we perhaps hardly know. Um, we seek to empathize with the perspectives of people with whom we know we are going to have disagreements with and express that empathy and express that steel manning in the articulation of our own positions such that it is consistent with the values of civic engagement that Better Angels espouses. So to be a member of Better Angels or to even be a leader within Better Angels is not by any means to prohibit oneself from continuing on in support of his, his or her own particular political ideology or in support of one's own partisan allegiance. It is only to hold ourselves to a higher standard of discourse, of behavior, of comportment within that larger shared sort of political system in which we operate and to build a system within that system, to build an infrastructure uh, within our larger political society that is meant to solidify and reinforce those higher sorts of, those higher norms of cultural and civic discourse without which uh, the stability of our society and our trust in our institutions will will continue to quickly unravel. Okay, uh, let me just uh, um, play the devil's advocate, here, uh, devil's advocate here a little bit, as you know I was going to do. <laughs> uh, here's what I can imagine a lot of people would say including a lot of people within a stone store where I'm sitting right now on Brown University's campus in Providence, Rhode Island. They would say, enough with this, on the one hand, on the other hand, um, false equivalency. Mm-hmm. There is a threat to a civic uh, a comity uh, and the capacity for us to function as a nation, notwithstanding the fact that we have real differences. There is a threat. There is a, a mortal threat. Uh, That threat is called Donald J. Trump. Look at how he's conducting his administration. Look at the rhetoric that he spews when he has his rallies. Look at the manic way in which the people who uh, follow him uh, react to the people with whom they disagree. Look at the nicknames that he develops for his political opponents. Uh, Look at the uh, way in which he seizes upon uh, opportunistically any uh, chance uh, to uh, rev up his base and to uh, denigrate uh, the other side, whether it be NFL uh, athletes or whatever, whatever, okay? There is a threat. The threat is called Donald J. Trump. The threat is not a generic, atmospheric uh, pitfall to which uh, any or all of us are subject to falling. This is not a problem about the human soul that needs to be healed by, uh, you know, we all praying across the table together, whatever, and I'm not imputing prayer to you specifically, but you see what I'm getting at. I use that as a metaphor. This is a threat brought about by a specific political development. White people of modest means feel threatened by the changes that are going on in the country and in the world. They have a champion. That champion has chosen to sully our public and political life through a specific set of very consciously adopted strategies. If you don't name them and oppose them explicitly, you're part of the problem, not a part of the solution. Mm -hmm. Indeed, yeah. And uh, I reiterate, (laughs) that <laughs> not just what you know, that's not me speaking. That's me no, 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 speaking no, no, I just, for I just, the angry well, and, and, out and, there and, who's, uh, you know. It is an objection uh, that I feel uh, that we feel constantly, absolutely, as well as you know from uh, from the right side of the aisle, from people who say that look, what, how on earth uh, can we justify any sort of uh, you know detente or diplomatic approach to dealing with 
folks who are supporters of what we feel to be, you know, people who support the perceived extremism of Black Lives Matter or who turn a blind eye to <coughs> extremism in, in, in the name of political correctness or, you know, who think that it's totally fine for Kathy Griffin to go and symbolically chop off the head of the President of the United States yeah. and preach to us about our being hateful and our being to- uh, bigoted, intolerant, et cetera. Right. So, but if, if you are, for the sake of argument, if you believe that Donald Trump is all of the things that, that you, in representing you know, the, the point of views of your, your colleagues and many others in America, just said that he is, not saying that I think that he is that way, not saying that I don't think that he is that way. Um, <laughs> That's but, my point. <laughs> right. But if you do feel that way, one, I think point number one I would, I would make is that the market for, for a political character like that to rise to the top of our, well, to rise to the top of our, of our, uh, of our society uh, came in place at the culmination point of a long downward trend in the quality of not just our civil discourse, but again, in the health of our civic society. Political polarization had been intensifying in a dramatic way for some time. The Clinton, through the Clinton impeachment, through the, through the Bush years and the controversy in Florida and the Iraq war, uh, underneath President uh, Obama, who ran a very inspiring ca- campaign, but then for various reasons, some, some, maybe, some fault maybe to be laid on him, some fault to be laid on the Tea Party, perhaps, a lot of fault to be laid on social media and things that nobody can control. Uh, yeah. That pattern of developments, which I think hyper- uh, intensifies our distrust of one another and our misunderstanding for one another has allowed it to become more and more acceptable for us to revile each other and to abandon previously agreed upon civil civil norms such that a blatant demonization of our political opponents in the media and in politics has become a respectable road to power. If you believe that Donald Trump is everything you say he is, you have to realize that that dissent in the civil discourse is what would have allowed for such an individual to become president of the United States in the first place. And if your response to that problem is to say that, therefore, we need to play his game better than he plays it, again, just putting myself in the mind of such an individual, I'm not saying this is precisely my attitude, but I would say that you have committed, uh, you have committed yourself uh, to ensuring that the cancer that this individual represents to you actually becomes terminal. Because the only place that that can go over the course of time is utter civic breakdown and is ultimately violence. Because you need the buy-in of a loyal opposition to maintain a a functioning democratic or civil society. And the fact that folks on both sides of the aisle have lost sight of that just lets you know that people really aren't interested in governing or maintaining real progress. They are interested in political warfare. And that is the spell which I, which we hope to pull people out of uh, at Better Angels and that I've been committed to uh, for quite some time. Yeah, that's, that's very good. You, you responded effectively to my, uh, <laughs> to my straw man. Uh, okay, so I give these spiels in my sleep every night. I go to I go to bed. <laughs> and, you know, debate, tell me this: of, of the many initiatives and activities that Better Angels is engaged in, uh, which are the one uh, one or two things that you're most excited and hopeful about uh, just now? Mm. Well, geez, that's a tough question. I mean, so I um I mentioned that I um, host. Uh, Actually, if you don't mind, I'll throw out a plug here. I co-host a podcast with my with my colleague Kieran O'Connor. Kieran uh, is a great guy, fan of yours. Uh, he was a former communications staffer for Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama. Uh, we have a weekly podcast which um, uh, in which we sort of model these sorts of conversations and bring on influencers. Uh, People, uh, academics, Jordan Peterson has been on the podcast uh, to speak with David Blankenhorn, uh, Jonathan Rausch. Uh, we had Ken Bone of 2016 election fame on recently. I just mentioned that because uh, we seek to build out a digital sort of infrastructure that can model a different way of talking politics and to uh, popularize it over the course of time. And as that develops, our hope is to use that 
as through through YouTube, through all sorts, through social media, to highlight the work, not just of Better Angels, but of Listen First, of the National Conversation Project, of Living Room Conversations, of a whole suite of uh, groups that are uh, investing themselves in the work of rebuilding civil society. So sort of uh, readjusting uh, civil norms in the social media and in the digital media space is something that's exciting to me and something that Better Angels is committed to. I mentioned to you Better Angels Alliances, and I, you know that is very exciting. That that's um, if 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 we within the course of you know the next couple of years are able to get to a point to where you have visible Better Angels chapters, visible Better Angels alliances in all 50 states in the country and in every major metropolitan area, uh, then suddenly there will be an on-the-ground infrastructure in place for people who want to be engaged in the political process but who, like myself, have some resistance to the sort of toxic uh, culture of condemnation that persists in the political parties, in, I hate to say it, but in so much of the activist communities on both sides of the aisle. Um, you know, these on-the-ground structures will provide a vehicle for people to be able to engage problems and, and issues in their own community in collaboration with people uh, of different points of views in a manner that allows for consensus to emerge on local and statewide issues that also requires that folks be sort of baptized through a process that educates us in terms of how we can most effectively communicate and listen to one another so that we might develop a deeper understanding of one another's positions and, again, the sort of human roots of our perspectives that in understanding one another's very varying starting points in terms of how we come to our political positions will allow us to collaborate more effectively on issues of, of more localized uh, concern. Oh, okay. So, but, again, forgive me for interrupting, but there's something I don't quite understand uh, because it seems to me that somebody's got to get elected to important offices who embodies he or she this sensibility in order for uh, the, the full uh, ambition to be achieved. That, it, that is, one can, you know, hold meetings and engage people on either side of the partisan divide to look more uh, uh, kindly upon their uh, political opponents. But eventually, somebody's got to run for office, right? It's some, somebody's got to actually penetrate the inner sanctum of uh, the structures of power who he or she believes as, you know, the philosophy of better angels is trying to teach mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, we're bigger than the fact that you're pro-life and I'm pro-choice. We're bigger than the fact that you don't like affirmative action and I want reparation for slavery. Uh, we're bigger than the fact that you are a, a religious uh, conservative Baptist from uh, Texas and I'm a atheistic, uh, you know, San Francisco uh, gay guy or whatever it mm -hmm. might be. Somebody got to get elected. But then elections are partisan. Mm -hmm. So so the the conundrum I'm having uh, where I try to work my way through is how does a philosophy of transpartisanship or whatever uh, be effective when ultimately one has to uh, plant one's flag on one side or the other in order to actually uh, get your hands on the reins of power and change the way things are done in the country. Indeed, yeah. Well, you know, plan A is to nominate Glenn Lowry for president of the United States. <laughs> you know. Hey, you all, he's just kidding, okay? I ain't running. <laughs> I, I, I don't seek the nomination, and I would not serve if you elected me by write-in ballot, okay? Just uh, so geez. you know. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, geez, well, thank, you, thank you very much, much Jack. We'll revisit this issue later, Glenn. We'll revisit this issue later. <laughs> um, but uh, short, of, short of that, the way I look at it is – I mean, I understand what you're saying, but, you know, I think that there is political candidates, good people run for office on both sides of the aisle. And I think that good people running for office on both sides of the aisle become less admirable in the course of going through the processes that exist currently because they wind up having to appeal yeah. to a marketplace of political demand that has been tuned to want a very sort of vitriolic and vindictive and yeah. also sort of intellectually simplistic type, type of political message. And those people who might want something better than that don't really have easy channels through which to express themselves. Yeah. So if we're able to create new vehicles for political engagement on a grassroots level, if we're able to sort of 
shift the media tenor somewhat so that at least in the digital media space, uh, we might be able to get new messages out there and cover the work that people are doing across the sort of party divide or even in modeling partisan discourse that is, you know, uh, politically oppositional, but nevertheless holds to a higher standard of behavior and a broader sort of sense of shared American identity within the variability of political, uh, of political uh, positioning, then we create a new demand for a new type of candidate. And so Better Angels does not necessarily have to run any candidates in order to stimulate a demand for a new type of candidate, as well as a new type of media coverage and new vehicles for political organizing. So it's more on the demand side that I focus as opposed to the supply side when it comes to uh, fostering a new type of political uh, candidacy. I think that if you build it, that is to say, if you, you know, if you build the, uh, you build up and, uh, and channel the desire for a new type of politics, you will have people looking to run for office who will seek to respond to that. And if you don't do that, then then office seekers, no matter how noble they may be as individuals, can only respond to the lowest common denominator aspirations of the electorate such as they exist today. So, yeah, that's what we seek to change. No, that, that's a very uh, compelling uh, That's a very compelling answer to the question I was asking you. I, I, I see what you're getting at. Um, and speaking of the supply side, uh, you yourself have stood for office at one point or another in your illustrious career. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how illustrious. <laughs> was that, that was before you found the religion and understood that partisanship was not the way, or was that a part of your general philosophy of transcending uh, mm. red-blue divides and uh, whatnot? Tell us about that. No, definitely, uh, definitely the latter. Um, so, excuse me. I um yeah so I was a Republican nominee for Congress in 2014 in the 43rd district of California precisely where I'm sitting uh, right now I ran against Congresswoman Maxine Waters who uh, you may have heard of of course yeah I've heard of her and, um, <laughs> I don't and, think she's got the Better Angels religion though last time I checked <laughs> <laughs> not particularly maybe not particularly um, and um, in any event. Um, but Congresswoman Waters uh, represents a district which is uh, comprised largely of inner city communities, including South, uh, South, uh, South Los Angeles, erstwhile South Central Los Angeles, uh, from which I speak to you now. Yeah. Um, the city of Inglewood, the western edge of Watts, uh, yeah. as well as a uh, pocket of the South Bay uh, area of Los Angeles County, which is more sort of white and Asian uh, suburban middle class community and which is politically much more evenly split. But the district is overwhelmingly black and Latino, overwhelmingly left leaning, overwhelmingly urban and inner city and so forth. And you live in the district. <clears throat> and I live in the district. That's right. Yeah, I live just outside of Inglewood in, uh, in South Los Angeles. That is correct. And uh, uh, how did you come to run as a Republican and how did how did the election go? Well, gotcha. I, I know how the, how the outcome went. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, so skip to the end really quickly. I am not a I'm not a member of Congress. I did not win that election. I did do better uh, than any uh, Republican or Democrat who had run against Maxine Waters previously. Now, in all in all honesty, that was in part owing to uh, redistricting. The district was redistricted in such a way that a few more Republicans were grafted into it then we're in the previous district lines that she represented prior to that. But the other part of it is just that I was, you know, I lived in, was rooted in inner city community, and I did not run a partisan campaign. I talked to people about issues and the things that they cared about. I never made a secret of the fact that I was a Republican. I mean, I, you know, I was, Larry Elder interviewed me uh, twice. Well, once during that campaign, once shortly after, and I was written about in the National Review. That was, that was out there, you know, yeah. my party affiliation. Um, although people didn't always know that just, just in meeting me. But I found that in having objective conversations with people about issues they cared about, it was not hard for me to find uh, immense common ground with the the people in the district, and once people realized there was common ground between us, then they then learned that I was a Republican. Suddenly, the the question was less, uh, you know, like, "Oh, you're a, you're a Republican, so you must be with those Tea Party races and so forth," and was more, 
at that point, it was more like, wait a second, you're Republican, but how can that be? We agree on so many things and so forth. But let, let me zoom out a little did, bit. Did, did she debate you uh, with you during that campaign? <laughs> uh, yes, although uh, not, not, we debated on accident. <laughs> I can tell you. I can tell you that story. Let, let me just tell you, uh, though, kind of what made me run because I, okay. I grew up. I, I grew up as um, I grew up as a liberal Democrat, and I always. God, this is such a long story. I'm going to try and give you a short version of it. Okay. I, grew up as, I grew up as a liberal Democrat in a multicultural family, um, and uh, I, I may have mentioned in our previous conversation. I sort of had an opening line that I gave, whether talking to a black democratic church in South LA or to a white Tea Party group, overwhelmingly white Tea Party group in the South Bay. I tell people, I'd say, people ask at the age of 26 uh, uh, or 27, what makes you uh, qualified to represent a district as diverse as California? 43rd, and I tell people, I say, well, I come from an interesting background. My mother is a liberal black Democrat from inner city Los Angeles. My father is a conservative white Republican from Tennessee. I grew up explaining my father to my mother, my mother to my father, and that's why I think I can represent a lot of you. I always, always got a pretty good, uh, pretty good laugh from, from both sides. That's my a dad, good one. Yeah, my, my dad actually, dad, my dad is from Tennessee originally, but he grew up in L.A. He didn't actually like that analogy too much because he grew up a Kennedy Democrat. My grandfather was a friend of Jack Kennedy's and Pat Brown and also Richard Nixon. But Grandpa was a Kennedy Democrat, delegate, he and my grandmother to the Kennedy Convention in 1960. Grandpa founded Dot Records, which you may recall, Glenn, and uh, that was Pat Boone's record label. And before that, he founded the first radio show in America. Uh, it was a mail order record shop that sponsored a radio show called the Randy's Record Shop. And that uh, was the first radio show in the country to broadcast rhythm and blues and gospel music, basically black music, to a national audience. And so that was a big part of what launched. Wow. Yeah, that was a big part of what launched Solomon Burke and Mahalia Jackson and and uh, wow. Arthur Alexander and of course Fats Domino and Little Richard later on were covered by Pat Boone and you know so wow. um, so I, I you know I I grew up. Um, thinking of myself as a liberal in the tradition of Martin Luther King Jr. My father raised me to be proud of my grandfather's legacy and to be proud as an African-American. Keep in mind, my dad is a white man, but he raised yeah. me to be proud of African-American culture as representing sort of the high point of American popular culture, which is part of the greatness of all American history. So for my dad, Abraham Lincoln and Duke Ellington sit right next to each other in the pantheon of American greatness. That's sort of how I was raised. Now, over time, um, sort of what wound up happening was the racial conversation shifted in a way to where suddenly my grandfather's legacy and the legacy of Pat Boone and sort of traditional white Americana sort of sort of uh, themes, whether in popular culture or in history, uh, tended to be relegated to this category of appreciation, wherein everything that was sort of white and traditional and patriotic in American life was sort of looked at as an, extens as an extension of patriarchal and white, white supremacist values. I'm giving you real broad strokes here so I can cover a lot of ground. But that wound up sort of shifting my dad's attitude on things and wound up making me sort of question the degree to which, you know, sort of liberal values as they had emerged were truly in line with the liberalism of Dr. King that I had sort of grown up. Let, let me let me just stop you for a minute to make sure I'm following you. Sure, sure, yeah. So your father, grandfather, uh, intimately involved across racial lines and in the case at hand of uh, production and dissemination of uh, music that was coming out of the black cultural nexus, mm -hmm. uh, but that would appeal across racial lines. Uh, mm -hmm. Comes the black power, sort of uh, racial consciousness raising period uh, the, through the 60s and 70s. Uh, and it turns out that a liberal white man sympathetic to and intimately uh, engaged with and familiar with the cultural products of Afri African Americana is no longer uh, necessarily an ally and is uh, seen, looked upon askance by a lot of people and maybe even be his persona non grata. Uh, in certain circles of color and mm. uh, sours a little bit upon a transracial vision that he thought the early Martin Luther King embodied, but that the late uh, civil rights movement and black power movement had uh, thrown to the side. Am I mm. translating you correctly? You got it right. You got it right. Okay. Now that, was, go ahead. Right, now that, was, that was really sort of the trend and the pattern of things that kind of pushed my, pushed my dad in a, in a rightward 
direction. And it, it made me skeptical of some things too. But there are other factors involved with uh, me. Now, I worked for Barack Obama's campaign in 2008. I was very much inspired by it. I felt that even as I sort of thought that, you know, various things on the left were it kind of maybe looking a little bit questionable to me in terms of that evolving narrative. I still essentially believed in the liberal vision. I, I thought, I always thought of it as, as an, as being akin to Dr. King's uh, enlightened perspective. To me, King represented what liberalism was really supposed to be about. And Barack Obama's campaign, this campaign of hope and change, I thought was less about socializing America and more about delivering us towards a post-racial and post-partisan sort of society that would be in line with Dr. King's aspiration for a beloved community. And so I worked for President Obama's campaign. And in the course of so doing, I, in wanting to be a kind of... Uh, bridge myself as much as I could be for understanding between the right and the left, I committed myself to doing something I'd never really done before, and that was study in a deep way the thoughts and feelings and perspectives of Republicans and conservatives. So I did this at precisely the, about the same time that I had gotten married to my wife, who was from a very traditional Christian background, and I experienced something of a religious conversion. Uh, she joined the army. We moved to Colorado. We lived in what is that, the upper Midwest? We lived in a military community, and suddenly, for the first time in my life, all my friends are soldiers, and it's a much more conservative environment than Los Angeles. Yeah. And I'm reading books uh, that I've never really read before. I'm reading, you know, Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand, and Wealth of Nations, Adam Smith, and the Bible cover to cover. Uh, and just started absorbing all of this information and all of these sorts of, you know, different kind of cultural values and so forth, which are a bit more rooted in traditional American uh, 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 themes. And what happened was I just sort of stopped at a certain point and I, I took inventory of my, my positions and beliefs on probably a hundred different things. And after just sort of going through them, really kind of reflecting on it for a while, this is me living in Colorado Springs now. I, how old was I? I must have been 23 or something like that. I came to the uh, conclusion that, you know what, on a list of a hundred things, on 65 things, or maybe even 70, I probably fall, uh, I fall, probably fall right of that middle line, which is just something I, I never knew enough about myself to really appreciate about I myself. Let me, I, let, me, let me just ask you, uh, John, yeah. did Obama disappoint you uh, in the eight years that he served after that uh, rousing and inspiring campaign of 2008? Well, he, he did. Now, he, I was particularly disappointed in the midst of his administration. As I've, as I've gotten older, you know, I, I, feel a bit more, I feel a bit more forgiving or understanding of certain things in retrospect, because ultimately I do think we tend to overestimate both the – I think we tend to overestimate the power of the presidency in certain respects, and I think we tend to underestimate the power of the political process – to mitigate uh, our nobler sorts of aspirations in in the service of actually accomplishing tangible political goals. And so, you know, I tend to be forgiving of people uh, who are in office, who fall short of, of sure. my idealistic preferences. But Obama did disappoint me because I, my greatest hope for President Obama's, uh, for Barack Obama's presidency was that it would be culturally transformational along the lines of helping to sort of sort of uh, instantiate something uh, progressively approximating, you know, Dr. King's vision of a beloved community or, you know, I mean, <laughs> Jack Kennedy's Camelot. I, 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 I you know, I, I, in my youth, in my idealism, I saw in Barack Obama's candidacy, perhaps the fulfillment of what people were hoping for from John Kennedy. And of course that wound up being actually a very terrible time with the assassination of Kennedy and following for American civic society. And yeah. this has been a great time for us now uh, during and following uh, Barack Obama's presidency. And my real disappointment was that Obama, though he campaigned in wonderful poetry, did not seem to have a strategy thought out for how it was that he would broach this divide, which even it, even in 2008 was already, you know, percolating to a, to a dangerous point. Uh, like every other politician, he seemed to have, you know, the inklings of a strategy for 
passing a political agenda for getting health care reform yeah. passed and for bailing out the banks and what have you. Um, and, you know, I was in, in my sort of coming to ingrain a more kind of free market orientation in terms of my economic point of view, I sort of was not particularly thrilled as, as to how I saw his uh, economic policies playing out. It's a bit of a different uh, component. Okay. But I just did not, I did not get the sense that there was any forethought to how it was he would strategically go about repairing the frayed relationships of America's citizenry and leadership class beyond through the mere force of his charisma. And that was my big disappointment. In including repairing those divides across the racial lines. Including that. Including that. Now, you know, that is, an, again, I mean, I'm sensitive to how difficult a task that is. And I, I do feel that Barack Obama was unfairly villainized, frankly, on the right in terms of his racial impact, in terms of the degree to which he was supposedly some cold and ruthless partisan operator. If I compare Barack Obama to other politicians, to other presidents uh, from both sides of the aisle, and if I take into consideration the unique complexities of his time, keep in mind, social media was just coming into fruition at that moment. Uh, Barack Obama, just in being a neophyte, in being not so much merely an African American. I don't think Colin Powell uh, would have would have received anything like the type of of uh, animosity from the right, from the cultural right that Barack Obama received. Oh, but just in, because it was a different time. Well, not just that. I think that because Colin Powell. I mean, both African Americans, but Colin Powell was a known quantity in American. I'm just using him as an example, but as a you know, black man, political figure who could have been president. Uh, but Colin Powell was a known political figure. He was somebody who was respected on both sides of the aisle. He was an African-American from, well, you know, I guess actually Colin Powell is, I think, of a Jamaican. Well, he was an African-American Republican, a moderate Republican. Right. Colin, right. Powell, -American Republican. Colin Powell would have never brought uh, Al Sharpton as close to his White House as Barack Obama did. No, so no, he, no, he wouldn't. Would but putting that aside very quickly, I just wanted to make the point that you know, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't just that Barack Obama was an African American, but he was an African, he was an African American who nobody had ever heard of, who had a, you know, who had a Muslim or Arabic name, who people just had no sense of. And so I think that. Well, no, I'm, I'm saying <laughs> not, it's not just what his name was or the fact that he was relatively obscure before rising to the presidency. I'm saying mm -hmm. the specific content of the way he conducted himself in the office Contra uh, the way in which someone like Colin Powell would have conducted himself contributed to uh, the uh, to the uh, division and, and, and partisan divide that uh, followed in the wake of his presidency. Sure, I think that you can definitely make a case for that. But I'm just saying that there's a portion of it which was also circumstantial, I think, okay. that led to that moment in time being, you know, uh, as explosive as it was for civil society, both with respect to sort of his identity as he was perceived and to just larger changes in our technological and sort of social environment. Brought about. I've got it. So he did disappoint you, but it wasn't all his fault. There was other stuff that was going on as well. I hold him responsible because he, he the thing that, even though I don't think that he intended to be uniquely polarizing, I do think that the, the reason he needed to be held accountable more than other presidents and other politicians would be is because unlike other people who have sought the presidency and sought elected office, I think that he was very deliberate in suggesting that he would be culturally transformative in precisely the way that I'm indicating to you. Now, the fact that he failed to do so, maybe, maybe anybody would have failed, but given the fact that he put himself forward as a transform, transformational figure in a way that George W. Bush did not, and Bill Clinton did not, and that certainly Donald Trump never did. Um, yeah. You know, he has to be held to a higher standard. No, I, I, I agree with that. I mean, uh, there's no red America. There's no blue America. There's just one America. There's no black America. There's no white America. There's just America. It's in my very DNA. Yes. Remember yeah. that line? That yeah. line, I embody, because my mother is white and my father is black. Mm -hmm. I embody the transpartisan, transracial uh, comity, which I hope to lead our nation toward. Mm -hmm. that, was, that was an explicit promise. But, and, right. and he didn't deliver on that. More than that, he didn't really seem to have a plan about how he would have delivered on it. So, Glenn, this, this gets uh, 
this, this gets precisely to why it is I, I chose to run for Congress myself. Because in the midst of my own sort of, in, in the midst of the changes in my own political attitudes and my feeling myself, um, coming to realize myself as something more of a conservative than, than, uh, than a liberal, uh, I, I, I still, I still, you know, I, I was never really in love with the Republican Party as I saw it. I might have just registered independent, but there, there was a, both a dignity and an aspiration that I had to give, an indignity and an aspiration that I felt I, that I felt compelled to give voice to. The indignity was the fact that, on the one hand, there was, you know, this narrative that th there's this narrative of con condemnation coming, coming from the left that seemed to vilify all things sort of white and traditional as patriarchal and, and, and racist that allowed for a person like my own father, for instance, who was the father of African American children who had happened to become politically conservative, but who has been a person embracing of the multicultural and the melting pot sort of uh, identity of American life and a person who is, you know, well enmeshed in, in, uh, with empathy and the minority experience for the minority experience, that the narrative had shifted so that such a man as that could be viewed as racist on the basis of his political leanings was an indignity that I wanted to try and sort of publicly, publicly remedy. On the other hand, I had an aspiration to bring a sort of an, an alternative sort of political vantage point to the black community in particular <laughs> In the course of my sort of studying things, I had come to believe had been grossly sort of underserved by the single party allegiance and the sort of uh, the sort of uh, ideological um, myopic orthodoxy that had sort of been governing black thought from the great society on to the current moment. Uh, and and again, even on the up, even even to add to that, I felt that even given the fact that I felt that problem needed to be solved and that it would be good for there to be the introduction of a sort of a, a different way of looking at things in my own community in particular, because we moved back from Colorado to South Los Angeles. And in another turn of events, I wound up living in the Jordan Down Projects for about a year or so. My wife was from the Jordan Down Projects. I grew up with family in inner city Los Angeles. I mean, it's an area that I knew yeah. well and wound up living in, had connection to. Yeah. Uh, but even at that, I, I also felt, I guess, a second indignity. I, I felt a bit of an indignity that people on the right, for all of the common sense that I had come to sort of ascribe to conservatism, nevertheless didn't really have, uh, Republicans, I felt, didn't really have a great feel for a lot of the unique factors that were sort of opposing the progress of African Americans, such that even though the primary issues in the black community, I thought, that needed to be solved were ones of behavior more than structural oppression. I felt that yeah. acknowledging those structural issues was relevant to being able to forge a bridge of communication to allow for us to create a coalition around the cultural changes that needed to be that needed to take place to allow for more effective reforms uh, to yeah. be able to materialize. And so, for all of those reasons, doesn't fit very well in a bumper sticker, I'll admit. But for all of those reasons, uh, I thought, um, what better thing could I do? Then go back home and do something which might be kind of fun. And Let that's me ask you this. Uh, did uh, did Congressman Maxine Waters play a race card on you during that 2014 campaign? You're half black. <clears throat> you don't really represent the black community. You're Republican. You're a Clarence, Clarence Thomas lawn jockey, uh, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> you know, I, I, I didn't. I did not get much of that at all, and and never Good. from Congressman Waters directly. But the thing is, is I never attacked Maxine Waters. Not really, you know. I see. Um, my campaign was like this. I did not have any money, right? Nobody knew who I was. <laughs> I started knocking on doors in the neighborhood and going to Republican clubs and black churches. I, you know, I, I worked in sales at a high school. I knew what it was to do door-to-door -door marketing and so yeah. forth. <clears throat> so I just, I just put those, those skills to work. And I was just a guy campaigning from neighborhood to neighborhood and so forth. So I would go and I would talk to people. I would ask people in the neighborhood. I would say, well, what are your, I, said, I, I would say, this was my pitch, as I recall it. I would say, hey, my name is John Wood Jr. Uh, I say, I say, you know, I, say, I, I actually live uh, in the neighborhood here. I don't live too far from here. I live over on Century and Crenshaw, so on and so forth. And uh, I'm actually, believe it or not, I'm actually running for Congress. 
I'm ready running to represent uh, represent this neighborhood. And you don't have to vote for me, but I just wanted to ask you very quickly, if there was one thing in our community here that you could solve, one problem, or nationally, one problem you could solve in American politics, what would it be? And, you know, people would be like, oh, nobody asked me that question, or, or oh, I've got an opinion on that, or what? wait a second, who are you running against? You know, <laughs> then I'd have to tell them, but then it would be like, oh, boy, you know. And more often than not, people would be like, you run against Maxine Waters? Boy, you crazy. You know, yeah, or, exactly. it would, or it would be like, Maxine, okay, I'm going to vote for you, but don't tell nobody, you know. Okay. <laughs> all sorts of reactions. But usually I would be able to kick off a conversation <clears throat> about, uh, about issues, right, which allowed me to have substantive interactions with people, and then they'd bring me to their church or they'd bring me to meet their friends, so on and so forth. And when the, when the subject got around to the parties, because, you know, sometimes people would – talk about, well, the racism of the Republican Party, for instance, is, yeah. or of white people generally, is the problem that we need to solve, so on and so forth. It would become relevant that I was a Republican or that my father was white and so forth. Yeah. And then we'd have this conversation, like, wait a second, man, like, you know, like, look, brother, you, you look like you've coming from the right place, so, so how in the hell can you be a Republican? Uh, and how in the hell can you be carrying water for these racist white folks? And I tell them, I'd be like, well, look, like, my dad is a Republican. My dad is a white man. My dad is a white man from the South. I said, but, you know, it, but his heroes in life growing up were people like Willie Mays and Muhammad Ali and Bill Evans. Those are my dad's heroes in life. Bill Evans was a white jazz pianist. Who came he was a family. damn good pianist, I can tell you that. Yeah, well, yeah, there you go. Playing with Miles Davis and John Coltrane at first. My dad is a jazz pianist. He made records with Joe Henderson and Woody Shaw, if you know those names. I mean, that's my dad's life. Sure, right? I know Joe Henderson, yeah. and I know Woody Shaw, man. Is that so? Okay, okay. yeah, Matt Hentoff. I'm from the south side of Chicago, born 1948, so, you know. Oh, see, you and I need to have a whole other conversation. <laughs> yeah, me and your dad are probably roughly the same age. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, that's true. My dad was born in 1950. And, uh, you know, and, uh, and I, I tell me, and, and also, you know, black folks in the community, um, people of a certain age across the district remembered my grandfather. White folks typically remembered him for dot records, and black folks, you know, keep in mind, in South Los Angeles, most people over the age of about 55 or 60 come from Mississippi, sure. or Arkansas, Alabama, right? Right. Uh, and so folks, you know, that generation grew up listening to the Randy's record shop. And so, you know, I find out Randy Wood was my grandfather and so forth. It just yeah. provided a whole new context because – you know, it, I was able to sort of tell the story of my own family in a way so as to suggest that while there's legitimate criticism, criticisms and concerns and frustrations that I share to be had with yeah. this sort of cultural language of right-wing republicanism, don't let that fool you into thinking that every white person, every Republican or, or conservative old white man that you know is, you know, is somehow a racist or otherwise has got it out for or is opposed to the interests of the black community. I can tell you from my own personal experience uh, that that is not true, starting with my father, but going well beyond my father, the relationships and friendships I've developed uh, with, with conservative, conservative white folks and Republicans across the wide, the wide spectrum of experience. And so bouncing back and forth from one side of the district to the other, from one, you know, talking to people of one race or the other, one party or the other, I'm able to tell stories about the ways in which people on the other side of the tracks actually share a whole lot more of their values and concerns than, than you might realize, right? Yeah, I hear you. So that, was, that was the theme of my campaign, and a lot of it was in the churches, you know, in black churches. I couldn't always get into all of them, because as, as the campaign progressed and people started to notice who I was actually running against, <laughs> you know. I noticed doors starting to close because people didn't want to make certain folks upset. Well, I can know. imagine that that's a very sensitive thing and that if you're a pastor of a church and you want to be the pastor in two or five or ten years, you don't want to take on Maxine Waters in South Los Angeles. Your parishioners right. might not appreciate that and they might not understand what you're doing. I but apologize, I, I, John. I have to cut you off because I'm out of time here. I have another oh, not appointment. Not Mm -hmm. So uh, I just want to thank you, John Wood, uh, Director of Media Development for Better Angels, for coming on the show. This is going to be the second of a series of conversations that you and I have. I'm confident, um, and in your breath of fresh air, I really appreciate the work that you're doing. Well, thank you, Glenn, and I, I feel like we're just uh, just scratching the surface, and uh, and I hope that that's the case very much. Uh, I appreciate okay. it. Okay, we'll talk again. Yeah. Take care, my friend. All right, you too. Thank you, Glenn.